Hello all. Um, welcome and thank you for coming to our eighth lecture in the North Seattle College uh, Visiting Artist Lecture Series. I'm Amanda Knowles, the coordinator of the NSC Art Gallery, and I teach at the art department at North. I'm pleased to work with uh, Karen Stuhldreyer, who assists in the gallery and will be letting folks in. We are so pleased to be able to find ways to have artists continue to come and talk with us. The NSC Art Gallery is hosting a virtual visiting artist lecture series every other week this quarter, including this talk. There are three left for this quarter and we're working on five for next quarter, including the alumni panel. I urge you to visit our website to see the list of upcoming visiting artists and for links to recordings of those who have spoken to date. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that you can check out um, as well. Uh, we'll put the links in the chat. So we'll begin this lecture with some acknowledgements. First is our land acknowledgement. On behalf of North Seattle College, we acknowledge that we occupy the traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish tribe, a people that are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering dialogue and learning space. We ask that we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. And then we have a, a labor acknowledgement as well. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor that created the United States and from which we all benefit. We remember that our nation is built on the labor of enslaved people who were forcibly brought to the US from the African continent and recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge immigrant labor and recognize that voluntary forced and prison labor contribute to the building and maintenance of our nation. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Additionally, we acknowledge the critical importance of uprisings for racial equity that continue across this country in response to inequity and generations of structural racism against black communities, black lives, black minds, and black voices matter. The third slide that we have is our actions. We're continuing to work to go from acknowledgement to deed. And so I present this next slide. It is not enough to just acknowledge. We have to be sure that we're taking action and we show you here what actions the art department and our institution are taking to support BIPOC individuals and institutions and to be held accountable. Uh, we recommend paying real rent Duwamish and we'll put the link in the chat for those interested in looking at that. I'll do that in a minute. It is a pleasure to introduce you to Mita Mihato. Mita is a artist who works in cut paper, comics, and collage. In her work, she hopes to educate people about species extinction and habitat conservancy. In addition to being the associate curator of public and youth programs at the Henry Art Gallery, Mita is a career educator and partners with a number of local organizations to teach art workshops to folks of all ages. Included in places are many local libraries and colleges, Hugo House, Museum of Museums, and the Aquarium. She has a BA in English literature from the University of California at San Diego and both an MA and PhD in English literature from the University of Oregon. Since 2018, she has been the board chair of Short Run Seattle. Short Run focuses on the medium of comics as a coalescence of art and literature, highlighting artists who make alternative comics and self-published small press and handmade books of all kinds. Our comics and cut paperwork have been collected in In Between, published by Pleiades Press, published in Shenandoah, Coast No Coast, Seattle Weekly, Mother Magazine, Drunken Boat, and Pan America. Mita received a City Arts Project Award from the Office of Arts and Culture and Seattle Arts Commission for a book project called Arctic Play, which is in progress. She has numerous essays in print and has participated in and curated numerous exhibitions, exhibiting in galleries across the United States. Before I hand you over to Mita, I want to let you know that if questions arise during this talk, Please write them in the chat and we'll hopefully get to each of them. Thank you for joining us, Mita, and please take it away. Thank you so much, Amanda, uh, for organizing and for inviting me um, and Karen for the help behind the scenes. Thank you all so much for being here. It's so moving actually to see so many people from various walks of my life here. And uh, it's, yeah, I'm very touched. And, uh, you know, th this platform that we've been using for the last several months um, feels so 
um, disembodying and, and uh, awful sometimes. And it's, it's really nice to be in community um, with you all though. So thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get things started. So I wanted to open, I should also acknowledge though, before I open that this cat um, is my elderly 20 year old and she, uh, you will likely hear her yowling. Um, so in case you're wondering what that noise is. It's I'll start by talking a little bit about my materials. By necessity or, or by, by interest, I'm, I'm drawn to loss. Um, I'm drawn to processing grief, processing mourning. Um, and because of that, uh, I, I tend to be drawn to discarded papers, lost papers, papers that have um, exceeded their initial use value um, that we tend to look at as refuse, as trash, as something that is bound for the recycling bin. And I like to take up those papers and uh, and think about the lives that they've had, um, the lives that they can continue to have um, by kind of transforming them through collage and cut paper techniques. Um, in addition to that, I really enjoy working with paper because of what how we tend to use it as the surface for other materials to put writing on, to put ink on, to put paint on. And I like to kind of use collage and cut paper to kind of draw attention to, to that surface itself and to use it as a site for expression, to kind of think about the, the life again that it has on its own. So my favorite paper that I use in my work is newsprint. Um, and particularly, I, I really like using uh, the advertisements uh, that are in newspapers. There's so much richness in the colors that are kind of just blank space in advertisements. And I like cutting that out and, uh, and giving it new context. Um, and part of that, um, I really enjoy taking something that is designed for uh, consumer purposes and, uh, and refiguring it, um, repurposing it um, in ways that are often critical then of, of that consumerism. Uh, this is another example of that using the, the negative space in the Samsung ad to make this pile of polar bears. Uh, you will see these polar bears in a different context upcoming. There she goes. <laughs> uh, this is another example of that, uh, using the red from this ad for a David Brooks book um, to kind of sew into the American flag on this page on the right. Um, this is a page from a, a piece called uh, By the Dawn, which is a send up of the Star Spangled Banner and drawing attention to kind of what is woven into the structures and systems that make up this country. And at the same time, using uh, the actual article as the background for the page and cutting into it and calling attention to uh, how um, information is disseminated to us and to kind of say that we have control over this. Right? Uh, I also like using maps in my work. Um, these two pages are background pages from uh, a short story, short visual story called Hitched. Um, and you can see on the left side that I've cut into this map of the Southern United States um, and left behind the, the major interstates. And then I placed that cut piece on top of another map, the legend of another map to, to kind of create this layering effect and this disorienting effect. The page on the right um, are just kind of shards of, of maps that I've, I've pasted together. Uh, to create kind of like a, a, an imaginary landscape, um, an imaginary place. And the idea here is, you know, we, we think of maps as helping us situate ourselves, as helping us navigate to get from here to there and to kind of place us. And I wanted to kind of deconstruct that idea um, and to think about it in terms of, of loss, because um, rather than kind of finding ourselves, our, our constant state of being is, is, is loss and what it might mean to kind of accept that and to kind of think about how we navigate ourselves through disorienting and, and unfamiliar spaces in ways that aren't about control and aren't about um, mastering. Uh, these are other maps that I've cut into. These are maps of the Arctic and, uh, and you can kind of see 
uh, two different waveforms um, in this piece. Uh, these are background pages for a piece called Depth. And you can see there my cutting tool of choice, which is a scalpel. I love the scalpel because I order blades in bulk from a medical supply store. So you can always have a sharp blade at the ready, uh, which is really important, especially with maps, which is, it's, it, it's a paper that's so dense. They're designed for, for longevity. And if you don't have a sharp blade, your hand will, will feel it. Uh, sewing patterns is another uh, paper I like to use. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this piece um, upcoming, but uh, just to, to mention it briefly, you can kind of see how I've cut into the sewing pattern with these essentially panel shapes. Um, I'll be talking about my work in comics upcoming too, and uh, more specifically about this piece in a bit. Uh, I also use handmade paper in my work. Um, and this sheet is made, uh, the pulp I, I made from newsprint, threw that in a blender and then uh, created the paper from that, cut into the piece. Uh, this is a background page for a piece called C, which I will also talk about um, upcoming. It's another example of handmade paper, uh, just to kind of warn you that there, there are a lot of whales in my work. Uh, this piece doesn't, uh, isn't part of a longer uh, project, it's just kind of playing and experimenting with um, um, the handmade paper here. And then finally, this is a video that I'll press play on. Another kind of paper that I've been working with recently is tissue, cut tissue, um, in part because I, I have these piles of tissue that I've collected over the years and finally decided to work with it. I was a little bit hesitant because it seems like such a delicate paper. Um, but as you can see here, I'm, I'm kind of able to get a lot out of it. And, uh, and you know, you find this space of trust with the paper that you're using and can kind of, yeah, it allows you to kind of play with it, manipulate it, um, commune with it. Um, and so tissue has actually been a lot of fun to work with. Um, I wove into that, the blue that you see is cut newsprint. Um, so another thing that I really like doing is, is putting different papers into conversation with each other, um, whether that's papers from um, different uh, contexts, um, temporally or spatially, um, or papers with different weights. Um, as I mentioned, the maps are really difficult to cut into, but something like newsprint and tissue, they're a lot more delicate. And so you just kind of, I don't know, it, it does become this, this moment of communion with these, these different kinds of papers. That uh, piece um, that you're seeing, uh, this is the finished page on, on the right, um, which is part of my work in progress that I will talk about towards the end. Okay, so uh, where all this paper goes um, is into comics. I would say that comics, um, uh, it's my medium of choice. It's, it's the primary thing that I'm thinking about when I'm sitting at the drawing table making these cut pieces. I'm always thinking about how the pieces are playing into um, the way that comics are organized, the way that their narratives flow, um, the, the comics grid, how a reader might be responding to, uh, to, to what they're seeing on the page. And yeah, just show you a little bit of how that works. So this is uh, a page from C. And again, this is handmade paper that has been layered. And I got these different shades of gray depending upon how much ink was in the newsprint. And so you can kind of see the darker beneath um, this cut sheet um, of waves and then these uh, representations of whales in kind of a lighter gray. And uh, as you can see, I've, I've cut this sheet to resemble comics panels. And what that allows is kind of the conveyance of a narrative. So you look at these whales um, and you conceive of them in your mind as the same whale um, with a slight variation in, in movement. So it's as if it's undulating, um, moving through the water. Um, and that is by virtue of this gutter space here. My poor girl, sorry about that. Come here, sweetheart. Hold on one second. Sorry, <laughs> um, this is life, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, so the whales um, 
that are featured here, again, you're reading them as the same whale kind of moving through this comic. And the other thing that I wanted to convey here is kind of the fragmentation of the ocean space that is allowed for through, through the comics form. Okay. Uh, so this is also another page from C and, uh, and what I wanted to kind of highlight here is uh, the way that um, we move our eyes across the comics page. Conventionally, we would start um, with this panel, this first panel here, then move to this one next, move to the third next. Um, but the way that I've arranged the page with the layering of the papers, your eye is kind of directed to follow this school of fish um, up and around and across the page um, in a way that uh, is unconventional and is kind of disrupting our usual way of navigating the comics page. Uh, these two whales here as well um, are kind of swooping in from the right and into the page. And so again, asking us to um, let go of uh, what we've been taught or how we're used to kind of reading uh, an image or reading a page. Um, and the idea here, this, this comic is very much about situating ourselves in a space that is unfamiliar with and to let go of, again, the way that we tend to navigate the world, um, let go of, of what is familiar to us and allow the space that is unfamiliar to, to kind of um, tell us um, how we should be with it and to kind of follow the lead of these animals that, that make this space their home. Uh, this is a piece called Beached, um, and I think I made it in, I want to say in 2016, um, and it was responding to these stories about these uh, pilot whales that were beaching themselves, likely because of disruptive ocean noises that were kind of not only affecting their echolocation, but because they so deeply hear the sounds in the ocean, it was, it was affecting them uh, in terms of pain, in terms of, yeah, just their ability to kind of communicate with each other. Um, and so again, you can kind of see how I'm playing with comics here and also taking advantage of cut paper to create these two different narrative planes where you have the, the water in the background and then the Bristol on top with the ink um, that is kind of serving as, as the land element. Um, and then the whales are, are kind of in that liminal in-between space. So uh, this is uh, in between my collection of, of poetry comics. And uh, when Pleiades uh, approached me about this collection, my first thought was poetry. <laughs> and, uh, and I hadn't really um, you know, deliberately thought about my work in terms of poetry until that point, but uh, it started to, to really resonate with me and make sense. And, uh, and now usually when I'm, I'm creating, not only am I thinking about comics front of mind, but I'm also kind of carrying with me this, this toolkit um, of, of poetry to kind of think about the choices that I'm making and how I'm approaching my work. And so uh, some more whales. Um, this piece is called Lullaby, um, or it's one spread in, in a larger piece called Lullaby. I'll share some other pieces from it as well. And it is about the southern resident orca whales that uh, are endemic to the Puget Sound region, uh, whose population has been decimated over the last um, several years because of anthropogenic causes. And each spread and lullaby um, addresses um, one of those uh, causes that have, have led to population decrease. And this particular spread is on dams, uh, river dams. Uh, that have also decimated the Chinook salmon population, which is uh, the primary food um, of the Southern residents. And you can see here that I'm again, just experimenting with the comics grid with uh, the bricks that are used to make the dam. There is also this visual rhyme uh, between uh, the water um, that also is fragmented in a similar way as, as the bricks are. And uh, and yeah, just kind of thinking about um, what we're doing on the land here has an impact on, on the waters as well. Uh, this spread is uh, addressing uh, pharmaceutical contaminants as well as other pollutants that are affecting the whales. Very different from C where you got the sense of expansiveness here, the way that the water is configured, it's kind of designed to suggest um, containment um, and almost suffocation. Again, you know, 
being experimental with the appearance of these comics panels. Um, this spread is um, thinking about boat noise and boat traffic. And uh, all of the images that you're seeing from Lullaby, um, the paper comes from newsprint. So obviously the hands are coming from um, photos uh, in the newspaper. And then the color elements are coming from advertising. Uh, oil hunger, and again, likening comics panels to the partitioning of land. And then finally, I also wanted to kind of uh, self-reflect a little bit and think about the role that art plays in either addressing or um, inadvertently having an effect on, on climate and, and habitat and, and species survival. And, uh, and particularly kind of thinking about how um, when we take art to the environment, what are we leaving out? Um, what are we choosing to focus on? And, uh, and with that too, you know, what are the materials that we're using? How are we getting there? Um, and again, this is all stuff that I, I think about myself and, and have a lot of complicity, you know, in the things that I, I also indict. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so just, just kind of drawing attention to whether art is elevating the art itself um, or can we get back to the thing that we're trying to kind of draw attention to. Uh, the next few pages are from a series uh, called um, It's All Over and Other Poems on Animals. And it too is kind of a work of, of grief um, and mourning uh, uh, related to climate crisis. And uh, I was just trying to think through kind of the enormity of um, what, we're, what we're causing when it comes to climate crisis and how in the world to express remorse uh, when the words that we have for mourning are so pat and almost so small. And so this series just kind of repeats those words and attempts to empty them of meaning through that repetition. Um, but then also uh, through their repetition tries to see if there is anything in there to recover. Um, so you have these, these moments of uh, this tissue that overlays the words, trying to find other forms of expression that might express better and also kind of um, opaque moments that cover up the words and suggest a blank. The animals in this series, um, I've used kind of more surreal colors, um, unrealistic colors to represent them. Um, and in part, what I wanted to kind of think about is, you know, we're so used to being inundated with, with images of animals and images of the environment. Um, and by playing with the color palette to, uh, to kind of be able to see um, the environment and, and these different species from different perspectives um, and to kind of um, defamiliarize ourselves as a way to kind of um, discomfort us um, from how we're used to consuming these images um, because it becomes very consumerist where it becomes about us and the pleasure we're getting out of looking at these animals. And I wanted to kind of uh, stir that up a little bit. Um, so with my collage work, um, I love working with hybrid creatures and uh, there's something that's so um, simultaneously uncomfortable and, and playful at the same time by bringing together fragments and, uh, and creating these, these new holes. And, uh, and one of the things that I want to think about with these uh, hybrid creatures is is just the way that um, the way that we conceive of bodies in the world. Um, we we kind of think of ourselves as these autonomous beings. Um, as, certainly, you know, as 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 kind of people raised under capitalism and consumerism, as these individuals that need to go out and purchase product. And the way that we interact with each other um, kind of uh, suggests that you know that there's that body there, there's that animal there, there's that environment there, and then there's me here. Um, and I like the idea of, of uh, distorting that and playing with that because, you know, there's something that's really valuable about um, uh, recognizing how porous we are uh, and recognizing that my body has 
an impact on what it interacts with and, and vice versa. And so to kind of use these hybrid creatures as an opportunity to explore um, that porousness. So these uh, hybrids are from patterns um, and they are um, send ups of uh, the, the images that are featured on clothing patterns as if to, um, you know, these clothing patterns suggest that there are certain patterns, ways that we should be, ways that we should look um, and that we are asked to then repeat those patterns. And uh, from the outset, there are many of us, most of us, I would say, that that just can't repeat that pattern because of the way our bodies look, right? Um, and so these hybrids are kind of disrupting that and um, and creating kind of a, a form of community um, that isn't um, based upon sameness, right? But is based upon acknowledging difference. And I'll just show you a couple of pages from here. Um, so this, uh, as you can see, again, I mentioned this before, but I'm playing off of the comics grid here with the way that I've cut into the pattern, but then also kind of there's this, these artifacts from the pattern itself that are grid-like as well. I love that it says pleat here and that remains as, as part of the background. Uh, all of these images or the, the, the dolls, um, as well as their clothing and the purses are um, from newsprint. Uh, this is another page. Uh, again, you can kind of see how the comics grid is playing out. Again, I love this um, artifact, do not cut on this line. So this is another um, collage piece with hybrid creatures and uh, it's a collage poem called What Dread Hand and What Dread Feet, playing off of William Blake's poem, The Tiger. And, uh, and all of the images, uh, the color pieces are from an issue of National Geographic that was focusing on captive tigers. And the black and white images are taken from the art section of the New York Times. I uh, This piece actually, its origin um, is, I sometimes will teach uh, workshops on collage poetry uh, or visit classes and um, to teach collage poetry. And, uh, and I love doing that because poetry itself can be such an intimidating form to work with. And so just asking students to just cut up paper and then arrange and rearrange words until something speaks to you. Uh, it's just, it, it lightens up um, the, the task and, uh, and produces some really incredible work. And so this first page was actually a sample that I had brought into a class. <clears throat> And, uh, and I liked it so much that I turned it into uh, a longer piece. So. Uh, so I've been talking a lot about how comics are front of mind when I'm making my work, but I also want to speak to in back of mind is, is um, books and that when I'm making my work, I'm often thinking that these will be printed and these will be copied, these will be reproduced and these will be distributed. And so I have this quote from Linda Berry, Pass Your Paper, which is completely taken out of context. <laughs> um, in, in the original, um, she's, she's giving instructions um, on, an on a collaborative drawing exercise. And, uh, and at one point you pass your paper onto the next person and they will pick it up and and add to your drawing. Um, and it's very much kind of how I look at my work that I don't see it as something that stays with me, um, but something that, that is meant to be reproduced and is meant to be shared out. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of um, the, some of the book forms that, that I've made. So this is a reproduction then of C. Um, and a question that I get asked a lot is, don't you lose something when you take it from that kind of highly layered, uh, textured cut paper, and then you scan it and it all gets one dimensional and a, um, loss is my thing. <laughs> so if it does lose something, then there's something uh, to be said about that, you know, 
Uh, but then the other thing, B, is uh, is that there is something that does retain from from that original form. Um, and when I scan it, these these shadow lines kind of stay, and it gives the piece kind of a um, a fake dimensionality. Um, and there's there's um, such delight that I take when somebody picks up my book and starts rubbing their fingers on the paper. Um, because it looks like there should be texture there and it's just a flat surface. And, and I love that, um, that feeling of, uh, that, that, that's experienced in that. Um, and, uh, and again, it's a way to uh, acknowledge that, that there's something about the paper itself, not what's on it, you know, not what's printed on it, but the paper itself as, as a material to be um, celebrated and uh, that has a life beyond what, what's printed on it. Uh, the other uh, element here is this belly band um, that I've cut into. So each each book ha does have um, a, a, a cut element um, to it. Uh, this is the printed version of patterns. Again, you can kind of see the shadow line here. So it looks like uh, there's paper on paper when it's just uh, one flat sheet. Um, as a book about sewing patterns, the binding, I, I took a sewing machine to the paper uh, for the binding there. Uh, this is Hitched, uh, the, the book um, that has maps as its background. Um, and again, the shadow line here. This piece here is hand cut out. Um, so there is kind of, again, one element that kind of, you know, creates that layering effect that you got in the original. Um, I did need to share when I'm talking about books, I do need to talk a little bit about short run um, and uh, this kind of space where our books can be distributed, are distributed. Um, and, uh, and just kind of the, the thinking about um, my work as, as part of a larger community is really important to me, um, especially during this time when we're out of community. Uh, we were supposed to have our 10th anniversary festival back in November, uh, which, you know, along with so many other cultural gatherings um, have been postponed or canceled. And, uh, and I feel it, you know, it, there's, there's a huge loss without kind of being able to gather in this way. Um, so someday, you know, or, or we'll, we'll figure out what, what gathering and community looks like as we move along. Uh, so I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about some work in progress. Um, and uh, Amanda mentioned this, this piece in the intro, and I, I shared a little bit of, of it in the beginning, um, but I'll give some context first. Um, in 2017, um, I was honored to um, go to the Arctic um, on an artist residency in Norway, in the Norwegian Arctic, um, in Svalbard. And uh, there were about 30 of us artists and we traveled on a ship for two weeks um, around the coast of Svalbard. And of course it was, it was uh, a life changing experience in a lot of ways, but I was really struck by, yeah, just the number of conversations that we were having about what it meant for us to be there. Um, witnessing this space, being a part of it, um, but also participating um, in in climate crisis. The 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 uh, the footprint of this trip was was massive, you know, and uh, and you know we were in many ways behaving like tourists, snapping photos and 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 uh, and the way that we were witnessing. Um, and so there were a lot of questions raised in my mind about, you know, again, how we represent um, climate crisis, um, and what that means and how to make art responsibly. And so this book uh, project, it, it's an experimental long form comic book um, that is kind of addressing many of these questions and, and struggling with them. Cause I, I certainly don't have the answers, but I'm uh, more than happy to, to struggle to, to figure out how we, how we do this well, how we do this responsibly. And uh, one, of the, one of the notable things about this trip, um, we spent a couple days collecting plastics um, that, were, um, um, that, that were on the shores. 
And, uh, and the thing with the far north is that we've constructed it as this, this pristine space that we're trying to save. And when we think of it, we think of melting ice and we think of polar bears. Um, but our everyday habits um, are having an impact there, you know. And so for me, it became really important to kind of think about, well, what our, are our everyday habits? And so part of this book, um, this section, I'm, I've made handmade paper and I've embedded it with plastics um, that are part of my food consumption, you know? And so, so this blue, uh, these blue areas that you're seeing are plastic bags that would hold cilantro from the produce section and this little bit of red and then this this red that's coming across on this page on the right um, is that netting that is used um, for onions and tangerines or what have you. And, uh, and the process of making this plastic, uh, of making these sheets of paper were actually really, you know, it, it brought to mind to me just how much plastic is in my consumption, right? And, and uh, you know, by no means am I perfect and there's still a lot of plastic in my life, but I, you know, the creative process has helped me make some changes in, in how I consume. One of the uh, serendipitous um, aspects of, of this work is that the, the plastics start to appear to be like glacial ice. And so I'm really kind of taking advantage of that in, in, in making this book. Um, so this is one of the, the finished pages from this section. Um, and again, I am calling attention to our use of plastics in our everyday consumption um, as a way to kind of close the distance between the far north and, and us. And, uh, and to think of climate crisis, not just as this thing that's far away from us, but something that is, is very close to us and, and is within our reach and within our communities um, and within our questions about justice. This page is from another section within this part of the book. The book is divided into three parts. And so both of, um, so this handmade paper section is in the second part. And, uh, and this section, I'm kind of, there was this, this, this day during the journey when we did this landing and uh, the rocks in, in this space, they looked like flesh. They looked like, you know, like meat, um, chunks of meat everywhere. And, um, and, uh, and it was just such a striking moment for me just to kind of, you know, think about the way that this, th that I'm tromping on this, this kind of living um, earth, right? Um, and, uh, and yeah, so this, this section of the book is kind of really toying with uh, metaphor and how we are, um, when we're engaging in art, when we're engaging in poetry, um, and, and also just kind of coming on things that are unfamiliar, how our, one of our immediate response tends to be, what is this like, rather than dealing with the thing itself. We lean on metaphor to describe something. So when we are in the Arctic and we hear this glacier calving, you know, we ask, or we say, you know, that sounds like gunshots, or that sounds like a thunderstorm you know, and, and just to be able to sit with the thing itself rather than like leaping to what it sounds like. We're, we're so wanting to make things familiar rather than sitting in something that is, is a little bit uncomfortable. So these last couple of pages that I'm gonna show you are from the third section of the book, which uh, is going to, or is a, a visual sonnet. And um, so I'm playing with the sonnet form here. It is, so sonnets are traditionally 14 lines. And so this visual sonnet um, takes place over 14 pages, 14 spreads um, and uh, of, of facing pages. And, uh, and my love object here is a polar bear. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm kind of meditating on, on kind of our obsession and the weight that we put on the polar bear as a figure to represent um, our responsibilities with, uh, with climate crisis. Um, I'm fascinated by the sonnet form in general because it is such a um, tightly constrained form. It is, um, you know, so carefully structured, so rigid. And, uh, and in that way, it becomes a way to puzzle with difficult matters. Um, so poets will will put a, a, a very um, fraught issue into the sonnet as a way to kind of um, 
uh, understand it or approach it or consider it or reflect upon it. Um, so for this visual sonnet, I'm putting in climate crisis. So in the Petrarchan sonnet form, um, it's separated into two sections um, of eight lines and then six lines. Um, and between those is what's called the volta, this turn. Um, and so I'm gonna show you kind of my ninth line where I turn to kind of look at this matter from a different perspective, kind of changing the script, um, changing how the polar bear is represented to be something that is, is much more abstract. Um, again, I'm playing with these surreal colors to kind of shift our understanding of, of kind of the, the blank slate or, or um, um, canvas of the Arctic um, into something that is, is different, um, we understood. Yeah, so this is Arctic play. I'm about two thirds of the way through. Um, so hoping to finish it within the year, we'll see what that looks like. And, uh, and I think with that, I will stop. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, please um, follow uh, Mita on Instagram. Um, what a great option that we can see more. There are so many great questions. Uh, my first question is Joan Stuart Ross. Did you have a question? I wanted to recommend highly, highly, highly Arctic Dreams by Barry Lopez. And if uh, people haven't read it, rush to read it because it is so beautiful and fits right in with Mita's interests and augments and spiritualizes all of these issues. It's an incredible book. So I just wanted to put that note out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. That was actually one of the two books that I brought with me um, on the boat. <laughs> That's wonderful. It's so, it, it just, I've just been reading it. I just finished it and my work lately has been inspired by it. So I knew yours would be too. Thank you. Um, so we have a bunch of questions. Please, if, if you have questions that you wanna ask live, please do so. Until that point, I'm going to bring things up from the chat. So, but interrupt me. The first one is, can you talk about comics with a C and comics with an X? and how we talk about this kind of work you do and how it is similar and different uh, than what most people think about when we hear the word comics, right? Totally, totally. Um, and I should say that, you know, like if, if you called my works comics with the, the two Cs that I would not be offended by any means. Um, but I, I do like to draw attention to, you know, when we, Comics is is a, a medium, and I talk about this often with my my uh, my collaborators and friends and who make comics. Um, that it's a form that is is misunderstood or or just kind of um, understood solely as something that's about superheroes still, and it's it's crazy that 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 association is so strong. Um, and, uh, and so using the X as a way to kind of identify it as, as not that, as not mainstream, um, but also to kind of, you know, emphasize that word mix. And uh, there's something that is so magical about the comics form because it is mixing two um, different forms of signification, at least two different forms of signification. Um, most often that's word and image, right? And so you are representing something on the one hand with word, on the other hand, with image, what that looks like as a word um, calls different things to mind than what it looks like as image, which calls, you know, a whole set of other images in, in the mind. And then together, um, that creates like another form of meaning, right? Um, with my work, because it tends to be wordless, um, that those different registrations of meaning can take place with, you know, the, the photojournalistic element coupled with um, um, a drawn element, you know, but working with different forms of signification, mixing them together um, as a way to kind of um, bring out that magic of meaning. Fabulous. Thank you so much. We have um, a couple questions about adhesive, but you also sort of talked about 
how in the long run, what you are actually showing is a scam. And so what's, you know, I guess not only what do you use for adhesive and does it matter in the long run? Because, you know, with adhesive, we're really worried about um, archival and all of that stuff. And does that even come into it when you are taking your piece somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. So when I first started out, I kind of experimented with all of these different um, kinds of pastes. And, you know, I think especially with collage, um, you know, you don't, you, you don't want the paper to buckle, right? Um, because that creates some issues. And, and a friend of mine recommended Yes Paste to me, which is archival. And you can actually just brush it on, which I love about it. Um, and so um, that's my paste of choice, yes. Um, and, uh, and in terms of the, the reproduction part of it, I mean, part of it is, you know, you need a paste that, that won't buckle, um, which is important, but, uh, and also won't yellow, right? But uh, yeah, as much as, I don't know. I guess I'm, I am still precious um, in, at least in, in my private place about those original pieces, you know? Um, so I want them to um, have, have a life um, that is, I don't know, survivable, I guess is, is one way of thinking of it. Um, but also, you know, I, I am interested in going back to some of those pieces. Um, and I was thinking about this for By the Dawn, the piece that's about the Star Spangled Banner, and being able to come back to that and, and cut that piece up, you know, possibly every four years. And, um, and yeah, and so, and so there's a way that I, I too want to let go of that preciousness at the same time. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, there's a question about where people can get your books. Uh, so in between is available widely. Um, I would recommend kind of ordering it from, you can order it directly from Pleiades if you wanted to. Um, it's available on my website um, as well. Um, and most of my handmade books, if I have them in stock are also available on my website. Um, when the short run festival is, is back up and running, I will be there selling my books as well. <laughs> That's always the best, right? So that you, we can ha have more people kind of going through that and more in community, yeah. I have a question myself, which is, you know, I've had some conversations with uh, about the decision-making that we make in our daily life um, in terms of what this place is gonna look like pretty soon and just, kind of wanted to maybe just hear like one or two of the things that you decided that you could live without or, you know, that sort of thing because of, um, you know, this wanting to preserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great question. I mean, and, you know, and it, it is, it, there's a lot of privilege associated with it too, and being able to make certain choices, you know, that, that um, I have, a lot of options living in Seattle in terms of where I purchase my food, you know, that I can, I can purchase my food at a co-op. And so buy my things in bulk and, and package them myself, you know, with, with, um, with reusable materials. Um, so that's something also that I want to kind of appreciate. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things is, is that I, I buy bulk more, you know, um, and I forego, I don't know, this, this is, <laughs> A really silly little thing, but you know, like um, seaweed packaging, <laughs> um, it's just this, this plastic that you can't really do anything with, you know. Um, I've also given up, um, I've, I've become vegan, um, so I've have, have given up um, all dairy, um, meat, fish products, um, and, uh, and have kind of during lockdown have um, mastered making vegan scones. <laughs> so, uh, so if you want the recipe, let me know. <laughs> Thank you. I know. Yeah, that's, that's a hard one. Like I had sort of gotten it dialed in when I, you know, went to the grocery store, I'd bring my own containers and I would tear weight them and all that stuff. And now that's all gone. Like they won't allow that. Right. So, and I realized that that is a place of privilege. Like I am, you know, in a great spot to be like, I don't have to use your plastic. Right. Yeah. Great. Are there other questions? Is there something I didn't see in the chat that's important? Yep. 
Joan wondered what the other book that you took to the Arctic was. Um, it was a book on sperm whales. And I'm not remembering the title by Hal Whitehead. <laughs> and Patrick um, was asking, do you begin with a concept and then look to your variety of media to solve or express that idea? It's a, it's a mix. It's a combination. Um, you know, I, I sometimes get drawn to a particular material and, and sit with it for a while. Um, again, I, I really do want to emphasize just how much I, I love communing with paper. Um, and so just, you know, sit with those materials for a while and, and, and kind of wait for the story that it wants to tell. And sometimes, you know, like lullaby was inspired by, um, uh, a year or two ago, uh, one of the Southern residents lost her calf and was kind of uh, for a week pushing it in the water, this, this dead uh, whale calf. And, uh, and a lot of people, because I work with whales a lot, were asking me what my response was and, um, and, and lullaby became my response. So in that case, um, it, was, it was definitely based on um, something that was happening in the world that I wanted to respond to. Okay, there's a, um, another question. Do you feel paper is on a path to becoming revolutionary again with corporate machina machinations hurting people towards a digital only confinement and the talking point, uh, how paper is irresponsible environmentally? Are you concerned about the loss of your medium of choice or how powerful paper is as a tool for freedom of expression and how that would be lost if taken away? Yeah. That's a great question and um, yes to all, yes to the question. <laughs> I think it's a really important question to reflect upon. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I do think that print is, is hugely powerful and it remains so, you know, especially kind of coming from a background in zines um, and kind of thinking about um, how to communicate um, uh, in a way that isn't framed by uh, everyday uh, discourse, um, consumerist discourse. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that we really need to contend with is, is where we get our paper um, and the, the forests that are decimated in order to produce, you know, the, this, this medium that I love, right? Um, and uh, right now, I don't think we have um, the right relationship with the forests and with the trees. Um, that there is a place where where it can be kind of more of an exchange, and right now it's just all about extraction, and and so I mean I do think that that's really where part of the revolution will come from is to kind of think through how we do that responsibly, you know, so that it it is um, more about um, uh, mutual exchange and um, yeah. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Mita. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us um, and to like, you know, continue to educate on this important stuff. You know, we don't really even think about some of this stuff sometimes. And, and so it's really important that the work that you do, the work that everybody is doing around this cause, about around this loss is, um, you know, out there. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I appreciate it so much. And so good to see you all. And um, hi, all my friends. I miss you. <laughs>